Hi everybody, uh, my name is Kim Fogarty. I'm one of the physician assistants here at uh, Gemsec Specialty Clinic. Welcome to our 22nd uh, Facebook Live. I can't believe we've already done 22 um, of these. Um, for our uh, viewers that are tuning in for the first time, um, the prior 21 um, episodes are uh, recorded and they are on our social media pages uh, to use as uh, references. Um, just so you know, um, what we're going to do is we're going to uh, be talking today about how and why JSC organizes our treatment uh, the way that we do. Um, this is part two of a three-part series. Part one was actually our 16th live stream, um, and that has been reposted on our Facebook um, and Instagram pages for you guys to uh, reference. Um, but this is part two going into our, our treatment uh, phases. Um, Dr. Jemsek uh, would like to uh, make some announcements and do um, and give you guys updated on some of the general things that are happening with the clinic before we get into the inform information part. Thank you, Kim. Um, yes, we have a couple of announcements today. And, and by the way, thanks for looking in and uh, for your comments and questions. We very much appreciate it. Uh, this is meant not only for our own existing patients, but also for, the, also for those of you who for whatever reason cannot access medical care. We feel very sad for them, but we hope that some of our educational comments uh, will help you in your daily lives. So, first announcement is that we are moving, some of you know, some don't. Um, we are moving to 2000 Pennsylvania. These are our flyers. A similar uh, posting is on our social media and our website. And we are moving to 2000 Pennsylvania in about three weeks on the fourth floor. It's a beautiful facility. And as you can imagine, it's a pain to move, but it's also exciting. So we're very thrilled about that. We've been here 12 years, um, which dovetails and segues into the fact that Kim has been with us 12 years and she has chosen to resign. And this will in fact be her last day on site. She is working tomorrow, but that will be it. And I didn't try to talk her out of it because if you know Kim, you know she's a little stubborn. And when she makes up her mind, she makes up her mind. But we love Kim and we can't thank her enough for her service and for all the people that she has helped. So as Kim said, we moved um, our live stream number 16 up in the queue so that you have easier access to it so you can compare these two talks together. And if you remember, um, we did have a PowerPoint um, associated with that, which we'll repost on our website blog page, which I have next to me, as I was trying to make some points. And these are taken from actual lectures that I've given, and I like to use caricatures and um, try to, you know, tell ways and tell things in a way that makes sense and um, is helpful. So number one, just to go through part one to get you up to speed. Uh, there were three stages of JSC2 that we've employed for forever. So evaluation and stabilization, which may take several weeks treatment. And for those, those of you who want that timeline, it's 12 to 15 months, whether it's IV or oral, and then the healing phase. There are three um, stages to the treatment part, which we'll get into a little later. With regard to stabilization, I've been using um, the acronym POEMS for a very long time, and it's still held up. So P is for pain, O is for others, but others also include roadblocks, which I haven't put up. Roadblocks are all those conditions that preclude or confound uh, care. And I think to be a good physician, you have to understand those things and identify those things, uh, hopefully before we start treatment, but oftentimes it occurs once treatment starts, we have to take a time out. Uh, e is for endocrine disorders, uh, the most critical of which is probably adrenal axis or cortisol. And then fourth, um, M is for mood, which needs to be stabilized to the point that uh, it won't sabotage our treatment and S is for sleep. Um, and so these things have, we have to check these boxes before we start therapy. Um, the life functions don't have to be perfect, but they need to be stable enough that we can go ahead and treat. So definition of this illness, there are two long, 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 three page, single space definitions. 
of this illness, and I've just been using the same one for a long time. It's very, very simple. The, I call these major criteria. So it's chronic relapsing and otherwise unexplained encephalopathy, meaning inflammation of the brain, which can be associated with sleep or mood disorder, uh, cognitive processing, um, no ability to do executive functioning, uh, and of course, rage and other, you know, unpleasant, uh, so the patient changes, the personality changes. The second is arthritic or periarthritic, and the word for the periarthritic is enthesopathy. So sometimes the pain is mostly around the ligaments and supporting joints, rather than the joints themselves. So chronic relapsing, otherwise unexplained. And the third is chronic relapsing, otherwise unexplained, peripheral neuropathy. That's the stinging pain that you get coming down your arm or your leg or your back or your neck. And it's also associated with numbness and sometimes motor weakness. So that's our definition. Minor criteria could include things like um, erythema migraines that's documented and um, what's called um, ACA or um, acrodermatitis chronicus atrophicans, which is scaling and thickening of the palms and soles, which we see. So that's our diagnosis and it's held up. Why do we say the word complex in our time? People are starting to pick up on that. A lot of people say, let's not use the word Lyme in our definition because people shy away from it. They don't understand it. And I, I'm just saying that um, Lyme is here to stay. I mean, you know, just the way we look for things. Um, and so we use the word complex uh, because it's all encompassing. And I think it's a very ties things up neatly. So it applies to the bacterial, physiologic, and immunologic manifestations of this illness. It is polymicrobial. That means many organisms. So we have not just the spirochete. And by the way, we don't know how many different strains we have when we uh, know we have the spirochete because our technology is just not good enough. So people can have multiple strains um, acting in multiple different ways. So that's definitely possible. But it also has co-infections, and namely a half dozen of important ones, and probably 12 to 24 minor, more minor ones that are less virulent, if you will, but Babesia, Bartonella, Chlamydia species, Mycoplasma, Proteomyxoma, um, and uh, like I said, probably others for sure, um, depending on how immunosuppressed you are. Uh, shingles, for example, you know, can be a you know vexing issue. Um, and shingles was one of the very first signs we saw in our HIV patients as their immune system started to drop down. That was the first one. That was the top of the iceberg. It's immunosuppressive, so not like AIDS, but it's definitely immunosuppressive. And so we see it in the counts that we do when we measure lymphocytes and when we measure both T cells and B cells. T cells for cellular immunity, B cells for humoral immunity, that's where the antibodies come from. Actually, they come from plasma cells. So it's not unusual to see low levels of IgG, which is one of the major uh, group of um, antibodies. It's also not unusual to see numbers that look a little bit like HIV AIDS in, in, uh, in terms of the CD4 and CD8 counts. So there's definitely a stress on the immune system that invades lymphocytes as well. Finally, it's multi-systemic. In other words, it involves virtually every organ, potentially. And it's also what I call multi-compartmental in the neurologic system. So the, nerve, the brain and peripheral nervous system are, have many, many compartments. They obviously all interrelate and interact. But, and various manifestations will emphasize cognitive, some basal ganglia, some memory or some all the above, peripheral neuropathy. And you have to appreciate that this uh, disease can infect every cell. In fact, Living Good did a study in 2006 from an NIADH, which showed she did a petri dish with all the cells known in the nervous system, support cells and so forth. And the spirochete drilled into every single one of them. So that's why I use the word complex. Um, and so going for we talked about this in 16. Uh, the Herxheimer. Herxheimer, where's our doctor? Herxheimer. I'm going to have these in order, I promise. <laughs> okay, here's our, here's our doctor. This is Dr. Herxy. Um, so the Herxheimer, Jerish and Herxheimer. So this was described with syphilis. Um, I think it, the term came out in the 1900s, early 1900s. But in the late 1800s, these were two dermatologists 
cousins, I think, who were living side by side, one in Austria, one in Germany, I believe. And they treated syphilis, and the treatment at the time was antimony and bismuth and arsenic and things like that. And they would have typical reactions with volatile pustules c coming up around the body and um, fever and chills, and then it all died down. And it was so reproducible that they called it, they, they named it after themselves. Well, syphilis is a spirochete. We call it Lyme's dumb cousin because it can do so much less than the spirochete that we're talking about. But we still have the Herxheimer effect because the surface protein of the spirochete is lipoprotein A, whereas gram-negative bacteria have a coating with lipopolysaccharide and gram-positive bacteria like staph and enterococcus and streptococcus have tachoic acid. So Herxheimer, and the tragedy of it is, and the conundrum is that it's in the brain, it's in the fuse box. So that becomes, it becomes very problematic, and we can talk about it later, Kim, about how we try to stabilize our patients before we even start, because their brain's on fire a lot of times. Um, it's a maniacal reaction to the lipoprotein, many times more than you see with other bacteria. Finally, in part one, we talked about uh, the implication of being inflamed 24-7. I can't think of another illness that does that without killing someone. It's like having terminal AIDS and being inflamed or terminal cancer, just being inflamed for the last several weeks of your life. This does it without, without killing people, but it has a marked derogatory effect on support molecules, on your energy, because it bleeds uh, the ability to make ATP. Uh, there's lots of tissue being destroyed. And I mean, obviously the patient's miserable. Um, and it affects eventually some of the other life-supporting forms such as sleep and psychiatric uh, stability and all that sort of thing. So having said all that, I made a plea for um, this being a discipline of its own one day, not to do what GEMSEC does or what Kim Fogarty does, but to at least get various disciplines of distinction in an um, educational setting, probably bricks and mortar, at least part of it, train people so that we can, um, and get them certified. Because this illness uh, be is begging for more attention and more science and less politics. Detox pathways are very important. So why, do one, why does one person develop Lyme? If you accept my hypothesis that everyone has Lyme, maybe everyone doesn't have Babesia because by the way, and you've heard me say this, I think Babesia drives the bus. But I think that there's a big unknown, that's environment. There's a huge unknown, but that's one key feature. Uh, that includes food, our food that we eat. I'm not, I'm not dissing the whole, the whole uh, food industry. I'm just saying a lot of things are modified, right? And there's a lot of pesticides going on and we're not eating like we did a century ago. Um, and also uh, in our environment, we're introducing a thousand chemicals a year which can't be good for the human condition. Uh, lifestyle is important. Uh, that's usually, usually not a problem in our patient population. And genetics is also extremely important. We're trying to delve into that and discuss what genetic mapping can do for us. There's so many polymorphisms or different um, variations of a gene that it's really hard to be very definitive of it, but it does give you some information. And uh, we've, a we've actually stopped doing 23andMe because of the political consequences, and we're, we're reviewing that. Um, okay. So, all right, finally, I'm going to wind up <clears throat> by saying that I think there are societal markers out there that if you just look around yourself, if uh, you're old enough to go back 15 years, we didn't have gluten-free aisles, and now they're everywhere. They just keep growing and popping up. They're more expensive items. Um, they don't taste as good often. Sometimes they do, um, but we didn't have it before. What's driving that? We didn't have all this emphasis on exercise. Everybody knows that exercise is good for you, um, although it has to be graded, and some of our patients are already inflamed, and I think we're going to talk about that later, too. Um, but all the commercials, all the infomercials on also on this new product, whether it's factor this or factor that, which is nothing more than a rearrangement of some known um, herbs and nutrients, nutraceuticals, and they're just rearranged 
and being sold like crazy. So I look at what patients bring me in. I say, well, I know what this is. I know what this is. Don't know what this is, but I know what this is. And don't bring me something with 30 things in it because that's 30 drugs, folks. So don't do that, please. But the point is that there's a huge emphasis on wellness through supplementation. Um, and then finally, if I haven't mentioned it, uh, sleep, you know, the bed goes up, the bed goes down, the wife gets her mattress cooled, and the husband gets warmer, vice versa, usually, I guess. Um, pillows, ad nauseum, we're selling pillows like crazy. Um, and I really get tired of the commercials, quite honestly. But sleep, obviously, has been recognized as very important. Also, smartwatches are out there, and there's a huge market now. It's really been growing. I've been watching it over the last year. So, I'm tired. Um, <laughs> that was part one in eight minutes or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> but to get you up to speed, and we will have the um, we'll have the um, PowerPoint uh, posted for you on our, our website. Thank you, Kim. Okay. All right. So now we're going to get into part two, and that's the the treatment of uh, this complex infection. Now, you know. First things first. This is a this is an ever evolving uh, treatment strategy. This is um, you know something that um, we're continuing to learn about these infections. We're continuing to learn about how these infections impact um, the the human body. And as you all know, everybody is very different. Um, so not only do we uh, is it important to uh, treat the infections, but also is to pay attention. Um, to you know how the body is responding um, and what's happening, and uh, Dr. Jemsek can vouch for this. We see you know new things, hear new things, um, almost on a on a daily basis, um, and um, a lot of times you know we have to sit back and um, try to research to say, okay, why is this happening? Um, how do we fix it, and how do we how do we address it? Um, so you know it's it's. Uh, when you're dealing with this infection, it's not just about knowing um, about the antimicrobials, but it's about um, learning more about the immune system, learning about how um, you know inflammation is provoked, inflammation is uh, quelled, and then also how, you know the healing process. Um, when I kind of describe um, our treatment strategy, um, I like to think of it as climbing a mountain. Okay, Dr. Jemsek uses the analogy of peeling an onion. We start on the outside and, and work our way in. Um, uh, but in, in that largely has to do with um, gradual intensification um, based on, you know, again, how a person is responding. Um, just like every Lyme patient is different, every treatment strategy is customized to that individual. So every, every treatment strategy is different. Um, when, with, the climbing with the climbing the mountain analogy, um, usually at base camp is the stabilization, which we went into a lot in, um, in live stream 16. Um, once we start, um, once we feel like the patient is ready to begin with um, treatment, we start with a, a gentle induction um, based protocol, which is kind of clearing out some um, free floating um, uh, extracellular um, organisms, and kind of, and, and for most of our patients, it's kind of testing the waters to see um, how their bodies respond. Um, uh, as we move through, as we move up the the mountain, we gradually intensify the protocol, expanding um, the muscle of the antimicrobials for the co-infections, um, some of the stealth pathogens. Um, and we also gradually intensify efforts against biofilm. Biofilm is one of the major um, defense mechanisms um, of these organisms. When you get to the top of the mountain, you're on the, the most potent intensive uh, regime. Um, uh, but again, it's important to keep the body stable and to keep management of the intensity of the Herxheimer reactions that Dr. Jemsek mentioned earlier manageable. When you come back down the back side of the mountain, your body is actually doing more of the work and the antibiotics are, are actually stepping down and are, are lessening. And then the base, the base on the other side of the mountain is what we refer to as maintenance, where um, the infections are generally in remission and your, your immune system is in charge and the body is, doing, is continuing to heal and continuing to uh, recover. Um, and again, things, it, there's a lot of moving parts uh, with this um, illness and with this infection, and it's important to pay attention to those moving parts and keep them in sync as much as possible. One that helps to keep the treatment 
um, moving efficiently. Um, it also helps to keep the treatment safe and also helps um, with uh, treatment uh, success. Um, Dr. Jemsek, we've gotten um, a lot of uh, questions and, and comments about our use of uh, combinations and sequencing of, of certain antimicrobials. What would you like to say about that? Well, this has been an evolutionary process, so I um, and my colleagues have learned over time, and I got a lot, <clears throat> I got a lot of experience with HIV/AIDS that combinations work, and then you have to look at the lifestyle of the organism. And all our targets are slow growing; many of them are intracellular, um, and so they're slow to they're slow to be killed. You know, they they just don't pop out of the cell and get into a wild type form and say, "Here, kill me." So it is a gradual process. We have biofilm issues with multiple other um, contravening issues, uh, which include everything I listed with poems, which has to be stabilized. So we're constantly restabilizing our patients as we probe, especially in the early um, portions. We start with a combination of three antimicrobials, uh, three days a week, couple weeks on, a little bit of metronidazole, which uh, breaks down the Borrelia cyst form, and then we give patients a break. So. I may be criticized for this, but I really, our patients are so sick, um, they're so unwell. And I, I relate it to, even if we stabilize them to chemotherapy, for example, or, or to, to treating tuberculosis with pulse therapy. With chemotherapy, you don't give a patient with a complex solid tumor and a, and a guarded prognosis, you don't give them all the drugs available to you in, in three weeks and say, you're good, Mrs. Jones, now you may go home. You're, you're not going to see Miss Jones, you're going to see a puddle on the floor because our bodies have to get rid of the waste, they have to detox. It's a natural process because cells are dying off. So cells that are infected, whether it's in the brain or elsewhere, um, are killed. They're dead cells. Some may regenerate, some may not. But I think it's very important to understand that the goal is to purge these infections through our process, which is really three steps in treatment. And we're talking about induction right now. Um, so there's all kinds of nuances here. It's an incredibly nuanced illness. And one of those is that when we introduce a naive patient to some supplements, maybe stabilize them with some neurotropics, things like uh, pregabalin, oxcarbazepine, um, and so forth that are really seizure drugs, um, histamine control. We do all that, we calm the immune system down a little bit, and sometimes, uh, paradoxically, the, the patient will get worse because now their immune system is a little more liberated. Most of the time, though, they feel better. Um, so we're always looking at ways the patient can detoxify. That becomes a mantra. So, you know, the diet has to be right. You have to have some kind of activity, whether it's even just stretch and tone. You have to have either passive or active sweating. So passive sweating would be the, the salt water bath or a um, infrared sauna, for example. And I like to tell people to hydrate with hot green tea to raise core temperature before they get in there because or after a sweat. Some folks can't sweat because their sympathetic system is shot. And so they're at a disadvantage. Some people can't take any of the meds or most of the meds. So th there are all kinds of challenges there. Um, but having said that, I will just say, and I think Kim would agree, that if we don't think we can help you, we'll tell you from the beginning, because we have to check our boxes, which is essentially the poems and critical support and so forth. Um, and yeah, let's get on to phase two. Um, like Dr. Jemsek was saying, you know, we use combinations of, of antimicrobials and to use his words, we use the best of the East and the West. We use, um, you know, commonly known um, antimicrobials and we also use um, herbal agents. Um, and it's important to you uh, utilize um, antimicrobials that have um, synergistic effects. They work together. Um, they boost the efficiency um, or the effectiveness um, of each other. It's very um it's very important to be aware of which um, antimicrobials will actually interfere with each other um, or actually you know, may um, decrease the potency. Um, but our combinations are selected um, in a strategic fashion. Sometimes patients um, you know, accuse us of just throwing um, the kitchen sink at it, but um, the, the rationale between the combinations and the sequencing um, is a strategic and, does, and is um, planned out 
um, based on the, the individual. Unfortunately, using in our experience in most patients, um, not all, but most, using herbals um, on their own, it's the, the herbal entities um, will have some antimicrobial activity, will provoke you know, Herxheimer reactions um, and so forth, but used by themselves, um, they really don't have enough of the potency um, to get a patients into remission or get patients into uh, maintenance. Um, again, we use them to synergize strategically with the uh, prescription antibiotics um, in order to get uh, the job done. Um, now, uh, one question I get a lot um, from patients, even at their initial visits and concerns, is if they have certain allergies uh, to um, antimicrobials. And Dr. Johnson mentioned that sometimes that makes our jobs a little bit harder. If somebody, for example, is allergic to sulfa-based drugs or allergic to uh, penicillin-based uh, um, antimicrobials and so forth. Um, for Generally speaking, um, uh, there usually is an alternative or there's a way to uh, work around. Um, these allergies, um, you know, we're always trying to uh, investigate and identify uh, different alternatives. Um, but for example, um, there's a lot of talk about using um, Bactrim or uh, Septra um, in programs, which is a sulfa-based drug. Um, again, if someone is allergic to sulfa, obviously we don't use that medication and there are other um, alternatives that we can use that target the, um, the infections uh, necessary in order to get the job done. Um, so I usually try to reassure patients that if you do have allergies or sensitivities, it doesn't you know, completely keep, us, uh, keep you from being uh, uh, treated. Um, um, another question we get a lot is when to use um, IV antibiotics versus um, oral antibiotics. And like we've said before, um, a majority of our patients are and, and can be uh, treated with um, oral antibiotics. The biggest difference, in, again, between IV and oral antibiotics is potency. Um, I'd probably say about you know 20% of our patients, 25% of our patients, Dr. J, um, are require IV antibiotics, and those are patients um, who have uh, that are more neurocognitively impaired, people who have significant uh, gastrointestinal issues, uh, or maybe somebody who's had extensive um, antimicrobial experience, um, you know, to date, and seems to have plateaued and needs a more potent. Uh, uh, program. So that's something to, to keep in mind. Um, and obviously we only want to use, um, you know, the the most effect, we want to use the most effective and the safest uh, protocols uh, for our patients. Uh, Dr. J, do you want to comment more on that? Right. So it, it's, um, this program was built step by brick by brick and it, it um, we never add more than one new thing at a time. And we carefully observe the results of that. But it's, con it's constructed to start out gently, get a feel for the patient, do kill a few spirochetes around the periphery uh, without any biofilm disbursement, but with metronidazole, <clears throat> then to give them a break. And a lot of times, um, I think one of the nuances that very difficult for most people to, to understand is that when we treat with a combination of medications and herbs, not everything is killing every single time. And probably the only thing that hurts is, is the spirochete. So, you know, unless you kill the spirochete, you're not having a big herx, but you may be killing other organisms. Unless of course you're getting into biofilm and releasing things that are excitatory, including the spirochete or cis form. Um, at no point during the three phases of therapy do we stop killing the spirochete. We just have an emphasis on uh, Babesia using various antiparasitics, antiparasitics in combination, whether it's uh, uh, Babesia duncani or um, the other uh, form of Babesia, duncani being the more serious. And so we have to use combinations. I've tried other things. I tried to shortcut it. It just doesn't work. Uh, after all, in the early phase of therapy, let's say we're in the first, uh, the second quarter of treatment or third quarter in our 15 month journey. Um, we don't have our immune systems helping very much. So that's a real disadvantage. And one thing we've done, we've had well over two dozen innovations in the last 20 years that are becoming uh, foundations for treatment in, in this disease. And the, one of the more recent ones is to retreat our folks for Babesia with a cocktail of herbals and a couple of antibiotics for two weeks a month for two or three months just to lock in the gains. And the reason for that is because and it's a testament to the immune 
immunologic difficulties that we have uh, when we're not severely infected and diseased is that now you have your immune system here. A year and a half later, your immune system at least is awake and can help us because we desperately need the immune system to do uh, some of the work. In the second phase of therapy, um, we started incorporating biofilm. And our agent of choice in the last several years is um, xylitol as a sugar alcohol. And I'm, I'm sure some of you are familiar with that. Stevia is another sugar alcohol, which is identical. We feel this is absolutely critical to the successful outcome of our patients in therapy. And the reason for that is that everything, every, almost every organism can make biofilm and they're um, in a menagerie, if you will. So it's not like there's a Borrelia uh, biofilm or a Babesia biofilm or a Bartonella biofilm. They're all kind of hung, hanging out together and they have their own little colonies, which you know they form and they break down. If you disperse the biofilm accidentally or on purpose, you have to kill what comes out. Now that sounds like, you know, common sense, but you'd be surprised how many people uh, are treated with biofilm agents day after day after day. But what you get with that is microbial chaos. The organisms come out, many may, may revert to life, to life forms, wildlife uh, forms, infect other cells and make more biofilm. So that becomes a, a microbial chaotic disaster. So um, I started with some very mild biofilm agents because I didn't want to hurt my patients, but then I decided to try xylitol. And um, I learned it from Montana a Surgical Research Group. And I talked to the folks, I read their literature and I was very skeptical, but I said, I'll try it at a certain dose. And um, I had 30 patients come through a six month period or so, all stable. I said, let's try some xylitol for a week or two. And then when they came back in three to six months, I said, what the hell did you do to me? I'm sick again. And as most of you who are our patients know, we, we try to do a limited exam at least on each visit uh, because we believe in touching the patient and we believe in talking with the patient because the patient is our instructor. And we learn so much from our patients, either from their treatment progress or from what they have to tell us in their experiences. And that I think is a key um, difference. Anyway, the, uh, this group came back and they all had big and puffy livers and spleen again, which to me is very strong clinical evidence that Babesia lives in biofilm. So if you don't do things intelligently and let up on the biofilm and give your body time to clear what the biofilm released, followed by a break, uh, then you're heading for microbial chaos. And that's been our policy for several years now. And I think it's made a huge difference in our outcomes. So as Dr. Jemsek uh, was saying, you know, we it's, it requires close monitoring um, as we're going through um, treatment uh, protocols to uh, not only in terms of monitoring um, what the infections are doing, um, but also in terms of how your body is clearing, how the immune system is uh, reorganizing, and also keeping um, some of the major uh, stressors uh, that these infections uh, create um, uh, calm and uh, balanced, uh, the poems, if you will. Um, that's one thing that we do um, at each of our follow-ups is we wanna make sure you know sleep is stable, pain is stable, um, you know, gut is uh, doing well, mental health is, is, is um, doing well um, because all those all those things can shift and change as we're as we're moving through uh, the protocols depending on um, the different uh, layers or the different the depths where um, we're getting at the infections and again peeling the onion as Dr. Jemsek would say. Um, there are certain uh, benchmarks and certain um, uh, progressions uh, that we look for um, when we're uh, navigating uh, treatment believe it or not um, we, there are some crude um, laboratory markers um, that we can do. Um, we do safe, what we call safety labs uh, with our patients to make sure that um, liver, kidney, uh, blood counts, um, and so forth are remaining stable um, as we move through. We don't want the um, antibiotics to cause um, any chemical irritation or chemical problems. Um, we will periodically do uh, different, what we call comprehensive labs, again, because we'll see shifts um, in terms of uh, pituitary functioning, in terms of adrenal functioning, thyroid functioning, and so forth, um, as in nutritional status um, as we move through uh, the protocols. Believe it or not, we've actually discovered some crude tracking markers um, 
For example, um, in some of our patients, uh, CPK can be a crude tracking marker uh, for inflammation um, in the musculoskeletal system. We actually think it's driven by um, the peripheral uh, nervous system. Uh, we, we think of that as being a crude tracking marker for Babesia, as we've seen patients with um, low level elevations in uh, CPK, those will normalize as the Babesia loads uh, go down. Um, uh, we'll see, you know, fluctuations in um, uh, liver uh, transaminases or liver enzymes. We actually recently um, received a report from uh, Dr. Alan McDonald um, isolating the Borrelia burgdorferi spirochete in, in the liver, um, which was consistent with a patient um, whose uh, liver was responding to antibiotic therapy, which was pretty cool. Um, so again, there's a lot of moving parts that you that we uh, need to uh, monitor. And believe it or not, um, the human body um, actually tells us more than uh, the laboratory studies or, or the paper. Um, one of the questions um, that we get asked a lot is about you know white blood cells and how they're Im impacted by um, the uh, infections and how they're impacted by uh, the treatments. And Dr. J has a good um, explanation. He can probably do it better than me in terms of why that happens. Well, thank you, Kevin. Um, so why can't uh, patients focus in on their lab work? So if there's one red value, they say, what does that mean? And oftentimes it's trivial. White counts, uh, normal white counts, four to 10,000 for all the, the white cells that comprise the total white cell population. So neutrophils, uh, lymphocytes, eosinophils, basophils, et cetera. Uh, if somebody has a count of 11, they can get distressed and ask me if that means anything. And likewise, if somebody has a count of um, four, uh, they're also concerned about that. With regard to the variation in counts, you have to realize that what we're measuring is 1% of the white cell population if, at best. It's just a snapshot. And the other thing is that um, with active bacterial infection, which we don't really see as a manifestation in the white cell uh, counts that we look at, you have to have bandemia. So you have to have immature band forms. Those are called just called bands because they're you know they're uh, juvenile uh, polymorphic uh, nuclear cells, PMNs or neutrophils. And if you have that, that's a different story. That's more significant, but we rarely see that. Um, but, but why can't I can't get excited about a white count of 10, 11, or even 12? Um, sometimes steroids, a little bit of steroids that'll bump it up a little bit, demarginate a little bit. If the counts are low, that's typically seen with Babesia, in our view. The important factor is the absolute neutrophil count, which is just a multiplication of the percent of neutrophils times the total count. So the total count's four, and the neutrophil count is 25%. That's 1,000. 4,000 uh, by a quarter is 1,000. That's, that's worrisome, but we monitor that, and it doesn't become overtly worrisome until it drops below that, quite honestly. If we had to change medications or alter medications each and every time uh, a laboratory was out of line, we'd never get anything accomplished. And I wanted to go back to um, sort of the overlying mantra for, you know, the, the idea that we tell our patient, uh, okay, we're getting intensifying therapy. And whether it's IV or oral, we use the word manageable. So everything has to be manageable. Uh, you have to be able to do this. And by now, you learn how to detox. If you have IV, you have IV lactate ringers, which helps you flush. Um, you're learning about stretch and tone or salt baths or foot baths. You're taking your supplements. You found what works for you. We placed you on some medications, which are non-narcotic, by the way, and stabilized your inflamed nervous system. Um, and so everything has to be manageable. And I think as far as the timeline goes, in our second phase of therapy, about two thirds of the way through, patients will start to have some better days on the off weeks. So what we're trying to do is, instead of having a pissed off immune system that's making noise where there's no suppression, uh, again, you have the means to detox, but the patient says, well, I feel worse off therapy. Well, you do for a little while. We don't tell everybody that, but <laughs> it's, just, it's a pattern. But you're also, you're also, a detoxing and you're also getting rid of some dead cells and you know it's just a downtime that you need to have as time goes on that turns because the immune system is being trained up because first it was angry getting angrier and then but not very smart and then it becomes a little smarter more 
you know, there is a, a focal expansion or expression of the uh, lymphocytes that control some of these infections as we train them up. Now, the counts may not go up, but we're training them up. That equates to having more stable days or days in, support, in the remission on the off weeks. Even if it's just one or two days here, eventually that'll expand into several days in our typical pattern. That's what we're looking for. We're looking for the reactivity that you have on a certain cycle, how long it takes you to wash out to get back to baseline, and how many blue sky days you may have had that particular cycle. And Kim, I think in our experience, it, um, it takes five or six cycles for patients to uh, to, to get into that remission um, uh, period and uh, start to see, hey, and what's happening is the immune system is doing better. It's handling the, the residual load that you have. We have more work to do, but it's doing better. No, I would agree. Um, you know, I, that is a question that we get a lot is, you know, when am I gonna get better? When am I gonna feel better? Um, not only from patients, but also, you know, their their friends and their, their family. And, you know, a lot of times people uh, will feel better even with stabilization, but in order to really see, um, you know, people start kind of turning the corner um, is, a, is a term we use here. A lot of times it takes, um, you know, some uh, consistent treatment um, of the, the different infections that are involved with this illness, as well as getting into the biofilm for the immune system to really start getting um, some traction, as Dr. Jemsek was saying. Um, I had a patient uh, tell me once that uh, she felt like she was a melting snowman um, in terms of her uh, recovery and her improvements. She said, you know, things are slowly uh, starting to melt away. And, you know, for example, her headaches are, are going away. Her joint pains are going away. Um, her fatigue is starting to go away. Her uh, her brain fog is starting to go away. Um, it, it's a gradual process, um, but it does start to shift. And I, I wish everything would go away all at once, um, but unfortunately, given the complexities of this illness and um, how it impacts the body, um, it doesn't it doesn't manifest in that way. Um, but as uh, your body gets stronger, as uh, your body's um, efficiency uh, becomes stronger, as your body's able to uh, manage the inflammation better, your immune system gets stronger, um, uh, tissues start to stabilize, your body starts stabilizing, and your body um, begins uh, to, to become stronger and more uh, resilient, which is actually really kind of cool to see because usually, um, either we see it or uh, family and friends see it first before the patients do, um, and it's fun to point out um, to patients um, as they're as they're moving through. Um, we have a question. We get questions a lot about uh, the pediatric population, um, and believe it or not, uh, kids actually respond very well and respond very differently uh, than adults um, with uh, this infection. And honestly, um, Candy uh, Willett, our pediatric nurse practitioner, can attest to this. Treating um, this infection in children is very different than treating it in adults. And I think a lot of it has to do uh, with uh, the fact that they have less wear and tear on their bodies, um, if you will. Uh, but they tend to generally respond very well and, uh, and uh, recovery seems to uh, be somewhat quicker uh, than someone who's in their uh, latter decades. Um, Dr. Jemsek, um, the, the objective of treatment is to reach a remission or a maintenance state. What can patients expect during uh, maintenance? Well, once you've gotten to maintenance, you've demonstrated that you can be up um, off of therapy for up to two weeks and feel rather tranquil. Now, that doesn't mean you can do what you did before, but uh, you're starting to get healing. And if you demonstrate that, um, by the way, our third stage, we bring out our stronger antibiotics, which are still using biofilm, of course. We use things like pyrimethamine, uh, rifibutin, and Cipro, and those who can tolerate it. And by the way, as an aside, you know, have to be careful about what you combine. So there's some combinations that are just going to cause problems. So Zithromax and rifamycin or rifibutin will decrease the white count. The sulfur drugs, if you're not careful, will elevate the creatinine, so we have to monitor that. Um, and rifibutin and mepron don't play well together. So there's an interaction there that reduces mepron. So we choose not to use rifibutin uh, on mepron-based um, trials. Etovacone, uh, also known in the pill form as malarone, although that's not quite as uh, potent. Um, yeah, so I think a maintenance looks like uh, you're you're having you're getting your life back, but now you're starting the healing, and the healing can take unfortunately two to four years, but it's a good journey because you can start to expand your horizons and do things that you couldn't do before. Uh, you're starting to retain, you're starting to be able to read and to comprehend, 
you're starting to converse better, you're not switching words out as much, your mood's better. But remember, we've been medicating all along um, to support you and sometimes working with uh, other physicians, whether it be an endocrinologist or psychiatrist or GI or what have you. So we're happy to extend that and we copy, routinely copy, routinely copy uh, friendly doctors. So just to show the progress of the patient, our mutual patient, and so that they can learn. And of course we can learn from them as well. So as I said, the process takes about 15 months. It's months, not years. And maintenance can be two to three years, depending. The more seriously ill you are, the more likely you are to get an extra dose of Babesia treatment, and the more likely you are to go to three years. Now, one of the concerns uh, that patients um, have um, is about uh, regression or uh, relapsing, um, which um, uh, obviously um, we don't want you getting any more uh, bug bites or, or tick bites or uh, infection exposure because especially as the immune system is, is locking in and it can be still somewhat vulnerable. Um, usually if patients uh, relapse, they don't fall down as far as they did when they first got sick because the immune system is a lot smarter and, and it's a little bit more honed uh, than it was before they started treatment. Um, but getting a, you know, a bolus of infection um, is, is not ideal. Um, other you know, nidises for uh, relapse would be, you know, major illnesses, injuries, or um, even uh, social stressors um, have, can have negative impacts on our immune system and ca can cause uh, regression. Uh, one of the, you know, big reasons for uh, maintenance therapy is to help your body heal and to help your body uh, become stronger. It also helps us and gives us a guide um, in terms of monitoring you um, and picking up some key um, you know, signs or uh, signals that your immune system may be faltering somewhat. Your immune system may not be you know, as sturdy as it once was. Um, and there's um, things that we look for, um, and, and obviously patients should look for that would signal um, a, a slip um, if you will, and obviously it's not a matter of uh, starting over, but it's it's about you know recircling the wagons, um, you know trying to figure out what exactly it is that's um, that's tipping the scales in order to get you you know get your trajectory moving forward and uh, back uh, to health. Um, one of the uh, the things that uh, we started doing um, in, in our maintenance uh, therapy is actually retreating the co-infection of Babesia, which is a major player in a lot of our patients' uh, regressions or, or relapses. Um, and the, the theory behind that is to um, is to treat the the co-infection with the immune system uh, being stronger and more organized. And um, this seems to be, so far, seems to be helping um, in terms of the relapse rate of, of Babesia, don't you think, Dr. J? So far, it looks like it. You forgot to mention the C word. The C word. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> the, the C word. We live in COVID world, um, and it absolutely knocks our patients sideways. So we do everything we can to prophylax them. Um, everybody's familiar with the CDC recommendations, but we, um, you know, if they've been vaccinated, I just say, God bless you. I'm glad you survived. And if not, um, we say, okay, let's try a prophylactic method based on what we know and what's emerging here. It's very hard to refute um, some of the issues with the vaccine. So, but COVID knocks our patients sideways. We don't want you to get COVID. Um, and we are able to modify the courses fairly nicely with our um, particular prophylactic regimen. And most of you are familiar with that. I think there's another issue. I think we're sometimes viewed it as a antibiotic form. And, you know, some people, uh, one, uh, one very good question here was that I've heard from practitioners, and I'm not sure who, but said that antibiotics don't work and there's too many side effects and blah. Folks, antibiotics are just a tool, just like everything else. We use herbals, we use support meds, we use dietary changes, we use activity changes. They're just a tool. And we, are, and we use them intermittently and very cautiously, and we monitor them very carefully. So it's a tool like a baseball bat, okay? So if I went to a major league park with a bat in my hand and went up against, you know, one of the greats like Tom Seaver or whoever the best pitchers are now, I would strike out, or I would probably be scared to death that they're gonna hit me. But if Joe DiMaggio went to bat, he'd probably hit a very nice ball. He may hit a home run. 
And so if I just use that analogy, I'm sorry to metaphor you to that, but um, Joe DiMaggio with a bat, and I'm not saying I'm Joe DiMaggio, but I guess I am saying I'm Joe DiMaggio. You must be Marilyn Monroe. <laughs> <laughs> the point is, it's a tool, and a tool used properly and well in conjunction with other tools is what makes the difference. So our, our programs are um, made of many different uh, um, types of medications and approaches, um, and we're constantly expanding our therapies, and we're getting very good results. Sorry for the sorry for the metaphor. <laughs> so again, the takeaway about our treatment is that it has to be customized to you. Um, there's a lot of moving parts, um, and um, you know. Um, there's things that we look for, there's benchmarks that we look for. Again, um, we will never know your body as well as you do, um, so we need your help um, in terms of helping us get the information. Um, we'll interpret the information and I explain to you why we're doing things, how we're doing things. Anytime we make any changes or shifts in the, in the treatment protocol, we want you to understand um, the rationale and the, the objectives. Um, and like Dr. Jempelik was saying, you know, if something is wrong or something isn't going the way that we expect, we will tell you um, and, we'll, and we will try to figure out uh, why. Um, we're, for these last uh, few minutes of our uh, broadcast, we're going to entertain some of the questions you guys uh, sent in um, earlier. Thank you very much. We're going to hope to get to uh, most of them um, today. Uh, the first question um, has to do with um, uh, dizziness. Why do I feel like I'm on a boat, Dr. J? Oh, mal de debacma. <laughs> it's my French. So, mal, ban, de, of, debarkman, debarking. Not so, not feeling so good getting off the boat. So the rocking. So we hear dizzy. There are three kinds of dizzy. One is the dizzy I'm fainting, and the blood pressure's down. One is the dizzy I you have two vertigo. But the most common one is mal de debarkman. And if you look it up, nobody knows what in the hell causes it but we see it a lot in our patients. I think it has to do with miscommunication between the brainstem and the cerebellum. And um, it is the most common manifestation of this phenomenon. Another uh, question I have here is regarding um, if you have major fungal or modal infections, won't antibiotics make it worse? Um, now, we have uh, different uh, yeasts, uh, funguses that live in our bodies, um, just like another, other bacteria, uh, viruses, and so forth that make up our big uh, petri dish. Um, it's really important to try to uh, keep our uh, normal body flora as balanced as possible, even as we're moving through uh, the protocols. Um, believe it or not, a lot of times our patients will have issues because their immune system can't keep things in check. Um, so it's not uncommon when patients come in, um, they'll have issues with you know, fungal infections of their skin, their toenails, uh, chronic yeast infections, uh, chronic bacterial vaginosis, um, and things like that. Um, we use a lot of supportive measures uh, like probiotics, um, Saccharomyces, caprylic acid. Um, and it's very interesting because as we're learning more and more about uh, probiotics, um, we're finding that there are certain strains uh, that are more helpful in men, in women, in kids. Um, uh, even uh, infant-based probiotics are really important in terms of uh, helping uh, babies' uh, GI tracts uh, develop and mature. Um, there are certain uh, probiotic strains that are uh, more helpful in degrading histamine um, in patients who have hist uh, complex histamine issues or MCAS or leaky gut. Um, so, you know, we're learning more and more about these and oftentimes we'll give specific um, instructions uh, about what probiotics, the dosing of probiotics uh, based on the individual. Um, yeah, uh, it, and it's really important to keep um, your, your body flora, you know, in check. Um, the, uh, Dr. Jemsek, um, there's a question here about, uh, pregnizone, um, and how this can impact, um, a Lyme patient. Well, pregnizone, the steroids were invented 45 years ago, and, um, they're kind of going to go to, to shut up the immune system by various specialists, and we need our immune system. Um, and while I won't I will admit that we do uh, treat some patients with advanced rheumatologic disease with a little bit of prednisone, although we've gotten some off of that. Um, it is the most potent uh, immunosuppressant that we have on the planet. 
Uh, and so we're very leery of that. We've had patients get a prednisone shot and or a, a steroid shot in a joint, and uh, that tips them over into the Lyme reliosis um, complex issue. So, I mean, we're not, and patients know they're not to take steroids unnecessarily. We try to find alternatives. Um, yeah, so. Um, and a clarifying comment coming from a former ERPA. Um, you know, if there is a, an instance, unfortunately, if there's, um, you know, severe um, inflammation in the lungs, impeding your oxygenation, if your uh, throat is closing up on you because of an uh, allergic reaction um, or uh, something like that, please use the steroids to shut down that uh, immune response and that inflammation, and we'll deal uh, with the infections uh, later. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, we interrupt this in... Uh, with an important announcement, we, this broadcast is being interrupted. Um, on my left, I have Sonia Okolo and Candice Willett. And this is um, to honor Kim. And so what do we have here? A we have star that. for a star. Aww. We have a star for a star. And would you like to read it? This says, um, oh, my eyes are bad. What you've meant to us is only exceeded by what you've meant to your patients. Aww. Yeah. Yes. Well. And it's got your name and your dates and JSC. Yeah. And it's pretty sturdy. Yeah. And for those of you who know me, stars are my favorite thing. Um, uh, Candy has been to my house and there are stars everywhere. Um, yes, uh, I am leaving a JSC and um, I just want to thank all the patients and their families and their friends for um, this great opportunity and working here has been amazing um, and uh, I am leaving you in good hands and Dr. Jemsek, Sonia, Rachel and Candy will are you know, have all my notes and will take very good care of you. And I just really want to thank all of you. And I don't like saying goodbye, so I'll say see you soon. Uh, you're the best. <laughs> Agreed. Okay, we can't take any more. Sorry, this is a sad day. But uh, love you guys. Be well. <laughs>